This is Lessons of the 60s, an archive project to document social justice work in Washington, D.C. in the 1960s and the 1970s. Today is April 20th, 2017, and our cameraman is Russell Belcher. Interviewers are Ann Gallivan and Norma Lesser. Today we're talking to Bill Trainer. Bill Trainer has been a, a Washington, D.C. fixture for about five decades first as a student activist, then an elected official, and especially as an advocate for youth. Running, running the Runaway House here and, and initiating the publication Youth Today. Bill, how did you find yourself in Washington, D.C. in the early 60s, and what provoked your activism, and where did you, what were you doing before you came here? Well, I, I uh, dropped out of high school in the Army when I was 17, and I was in for three years got out just before I turned 20, and I came uh, to Georgetown as a freshman at the Foreign Service School. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I got here in the September of uh, 1963. And um, what made you an activist? Was it being in the Army? Was it being in D.C.? What happened? Um, I think it was my general orientation, which I guess I got in part from my parents, who sort of New Deal liberal Democrats, um, and um, then some of the things that were going on in the world at the time, and uh, the, some of the people I got to know at, at Georgetown, I gradually um, got involved in some of the more activist things at Georgetown, which was a pretty straight-laced yes. conservative school at the time. That's where I met you. That's correct. Georgetown and one of the small activist groups. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about the uh, the uh, civil rights group at Georgetown a little bit, or the work that you did when you got there? Don't bang your hand. Don't bang my hand. Thank okay. you. <laughs> um, well, I think that my main obviously I was very sympathetic to the goals of the civil rights movement, so it didn't really require any particular. Yeah. conversion on my part uh, but I think I got uh, got some focus thanks to uh, Father Richard McSorley and a theology course that I took and I do remember distinctly signing up for the course because I heard he was an easy grader uh, which he was happy to say uh, but he really put us through the mill. The first book we read was Conscience of a Conservative by Barry Goldwater. Mm -hmm. And then we just went through all these, Michael Harrington, uh, uh, a, a whole series. He brought in wonderful speakers. Uh, and so by the end of the course, I was really much, I was kind of hooked on Social, social activism. I didn't need to have any particular ideological conversion, mm -hmm. but I, I, it, I got structure uh, out of, the, of, of my thinking, got some structure through that course. Um, and then I you know, met other people who were interested in things and civil rights and you went to the South for a little bit too, didn't you? I did. I, was, I, I, I spent about three years with SCLC. Mm -hmm. I, um, uh, uh, Father McSorley introduced me to Stoney Cooks, who was an aide to Andrew Young. Stoney Cook. And I went to Atlanta and I worked for SCLC. Uh, say in, what SCLC in, is. Oh, for Southern our... Christian Leadership Conference uh, run by Martin Luther King. And in Georgia, in South Carolina, in Alabama. Uh, um, and then I came back here, did some other things, and then I wound up working again for SCLC during the Poor People's Campaign. I ran with a guy named Ross Conley, the Poor People's University. Uh -huh. uh, Who was that? Well, it was a, not much better than uh, the Trump University, really. <laughs> no campus, no student. I mean, we had some, but we basically put on speaking events down Resurrection City in particular. 
uh, and uh, we, you know we had some interesting speakers and we'd sit right on the, the little hill there in front of the Lincoln Memorial yes. and these people who would contact us when we would screen them a little bit and, and put up some signs around Resurrection City and they would uh, get an audience maybe if you're lucky 20 25 30 mm -hmm. people depending on the weather it rained a lot yeah um, it's very muddy and uh, the one speaker who I remember most uh, d distinctively is a guy came I, 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 I never heard of him uh, no reason I should have and he stood up there and he made a very good talk about his family history going back and back and back and it's you know back to uh, the, when his ancestors were bought from Africa and whatever I thought well you know that's interesting but uh -huh. and a few so years later out comes his book Roots and all of that uh -huh. <laughs> you're getting a hundred thousand dollars to make speech <laughs> you can pay him a penny was of that course Haley? yeah Alex Haley oh yeah, my gosh. yeah 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 uh, so then um, when um, Resurrection City was uh, uh, closed down by the park police in June of 68. I had already made a connection with a Reverend Tom Murphy at Pilgrim's, uh, Church of the Pilgrims Presbyterian at DuPont Circle. And we sort of started a shelter for runaway kids. I mean, Willie kind of didn't really have any idea what we were doing, which was, of course, a merciful yeah. thing. Uh, and we got $700 from the, the Friends Meeting House on Florida Avenue, which was enough to pay two months' rent on what became the Runaway House at mm -hmm. 18th and Riggs. And next thing you know, we had 25, 35 runaway homeless kids every night. It, from, se it from seemed like you, almost as soon as I heard of Runaway House, I heard that lots of kids were there. And the early kids that were runaways were a different group than the later than the later. There were some Can you talk a little about that? And, wh and what about what about the times made these kids runaways? Can you talk to that a little well, bit? Well, I think there was a, 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 it was an era of un uncertain values. Uh, there was a, a, a fairly clear norm, and these kids were kind of breaking out of that. And who were these it, kids you're talking uh, about? Well, a lot of them were suburban kids, and some of them were from D.C. It was a racially mixed and a really economically mixed. And some of these kids were wonderful, wonderful. My stayed in touch with is now a juvenile court judge in Minneapolis. But a, a, another one is the leading suspect for uh, killing the Lion Sisters. <gasps> so you really? had a whole, a whole mix, Whoa. Uh, right. the whole spectrum. So anyway, I did that for about five years. I went to graduate school and I started national organizations that dealt with children and youth issues, mostly youth issues. And that was called? Well, the first one was called the National Youth Work Alliance. Mm -hmm. And I had my office for many years up on the fourth floor of St. Margaret's Episcopal Church on Connecticut Avenue, right mm -hmm. across from the Hilton, whatever. Yes. Right. A lot of steps, kept me in shape, no <laughs> rent, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and I built, built uh, uh, th that up over the years, eventually moved to the DuPont Circle building, mm -hmm. which was being run by Mayor Sammy Abdullah Abbott, who will, I'm sure, figure in some of your other interviews. Oh, yes. uh, and um, so I did that uh, for th throughout the 70s, basically. At the same time, I did run for the D.C. school board, was elected in 73, and was on the board for four years. You want to talk a little about being on the board? <laughs> well, it wasn't this was the, the first most elected pleasant position experience in Washington, of my right? life. I was really a very, very rigid bureaucracy, very unimaginative. Uh, just before I took my seat on the board, uh, the, the, the school board he had hired a, a woman named Barbara Sizemore who was deeply troubled in many ways uh, and so it was a very uh, discombobulated chaotic kind of a situation the president of the school board when she was hired Marion Barry he w was gone within six months elected to the city council <laughs> leaving her behind mm -hmm. <laughs> to the rest of us uh, 
And um, so that kind of gets me up to the 80s. How's that? Yeah. Okay. I want to ask you a little bit more about Runaway House, which became a real institution in Washington, D.C. Um, I once heard a rumor from an old friend that Vice President Agnew's daughter ended up there. Is that true? Not that I know of. Oh, but there that were was a, a rumor. Lot, but there were a, 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 a lot of kids. Look, it was very loosey-goosey in the way it probably is inconceivable today. I think for the first six months, we didn't even have a, quote, intake form of any kind whatsoever. You mean kids just landed there? Yes. Uh, I figured if they probably aren't going to give you the real name anyway, so why bother was kind of my <laughs> attitude. Uh, eventually, uh, we had something with like a half a, a piece of paper, a half of eight, a half by 11, and we get their name and whatever. They didn't want to tell us their address. They didn't want to tell us their parents' phone numbers and whatever. Not when they're first coming in. So you mm -hmm. so would pretty much stay that way. So, that, so that also meant, of course, the kids could disappear. They would go out the door for whatever, they might never come back. Uh, but those are the trade-offs you made to get them to, to come in in the first place. Um, you know, if you have a drop-in center with no exit, no one's gonna drop in, <laughs> not, not those kind of kids. Uh, so, yeah, we had up 35 kids a, a night. I mean, that would be the 35 max. 35 kids a night? 35 kids, that really packing them in. Yeah, that's a you. lot of kids. What could you, I mean, this was a great social service that you did in those years for these kids uh, and their it families. It was basically all gratis also. Yeah. Uh, uh, I know this is like talking about w walking to school in your bare feet and all that, but I had been in the Army and I was eligible for $100 a month from the VA if I was a full-time student. So I enrolled at Federal City College, and with that hundred dollars, I fed myself. I lived in the house. I had my, had my own room, a shared the place. bathroom with all the boys. The girls were on the upper floor, uh, and uh, lived on that. I paid for the payphone in the closet, which was the only phone in the house that the, the kids could use. Uh, and I had to also pay for the laundry because we were always worried about bed bugs and mm. all that stuff that you have to worry about, that kind of a live situation. Yeah. I don't know how we did it, but we did. And how? then eventually, right. uh, uh, Tom Murphy uh, suggested that I go talk to people at the Public Welfare Foundation. Mm -hmm. They were in Watergate at the time, and I, I did, and they, they gave us $10,000. I thought like I would hit the Comstock load or something. It was just an unbelievable amount of money. And I w was able to use that to great effect to open group homes and an alternative school called the New Education Project, a job co-op. Um, we had about 10, 15 projects at one time or another. What, like, what kind of projects? Uh, one well, they project? were all oriented towards uh, youth, mostly rootless. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but in the school, you might have kids who are living in nice middle class homes and whatever. But um, we, we certainly had a lot of trouble getting any kind of tuition or anything. This was, uh, this was when charter schools were just a glimmer in the eye. Um, mm -hmm. So now, a program like the one we were in would definitely be a charter school and be much bigger and much more prosperous, of course. Mm -hmm. But, and, and, you know, I would try almost anything. Mm -hmm. uh, to see if it would work, see if I could keep it funded. That was a very hard part of the whole thing. Uh, and we got money from foundations and whatever. I mean, we would go out in DuPont Circle with, little, with a tin can on payday around the banks there and everything and panhandle for the rent money. Mm -hmm. That's how poor we were. We didn't th really think of ourselves as poor, though. We just thought of ourselves as, at least the staff, uh -huh. we just thought of ourselves living in kind of a cashless society or something. <laughs> uh, uh, so, and, and eventually it got more and more organized and whatever, and I, so I did that for about f five years. But Runaway House had a longer life than that, right? It what did, I think about another three or four years after that. Um, many people worked there, of course, and. I see some of them, and they still joke about how I overpaid them fifty dollars a week. <laughs> uh, but two two of the women who worked there 
were, were Deborah Shore, who I was married to for many years and the mother of my two sons. Mm -hmm. uh, and she started Sasha Bruce Youth Work, which is mm -hmm. a very big agency in the city now. And yes. she was just the Washingtonian of the year yes. in that magazine. Housing for kids. And Lori Kaplan, who started the Latin American Youth Center. So they're about the two biggest service providers for homeless and runaway youth right, in the and city they, now. And they got their start really they at Runaway started, House. Right? They both started now, when the kids, when, when, runaway, when the kids were at Runaway House, did you actually have some sort of a program for them, or was it, or was it just for to stay there and, and uh, to be we safe? We were so uh, understaffed. We were so un underfunded. I mean, we tried to do what we can do. But, for instance, we would close the house from let's say nine or ten in the morning until maybe four or five in the afternoon there'd be a, somebody there because you never know when you're going to get a knock on the door uh but we did i didn't want the kids hanging around all day long do, yes. uh, nothing good was going to come of that and so they would go out and they would spread around dupont circle or whatever and it was a neighborhood that was quite amenable to that at the time mm -hmm. um those uh, uh kids who we could get into, meet with their parents or whatever, we would try to arrange that. Tom Murphy would do some of that counseling and so would I and meet over at the Church of the Pilgrims. And, but it was very hit and miss. Um, right. And I think some of its strengths were in fact that it was so hit and miss that there wasn't a lot of pressure on, on kids to do a certain thing do certain things, and there wasn't a lot of pressure on the staff either to make them do certain things. So, you, so um, perhaps, I, I don't know, maybe it was just my personality or pick some of this up in the Army, I just knew how to use the command voice and be mm -hmm. in control, and, uh, and ki kids who wanted to do something like get, get, get in the car and go off with some guy who they had just met 10 minutes before, go to Florida or something, I would just stop it, I just, just yank them out of the car if that's what I had to do. Yeah. Uh, and so it, a lot of it was just force of personality, really, as, a, sub, as a substitute for more kind of social worky type uh, culture. It was also a creative time generally, and you were very, very creative, creative, but people would try everything. It, oh, was, right, a good it was very creative, and uh, yeah. um, it also, you know, when you didn't have any money, Mm -hmm. uh, you, you had to. It's like you do these su survival stories. The guy who's the airplane crashes in the Andes, so what do they do? I mean, you just got to work with whatever you got, but yeah. and that's what we did. You must have had, a, <coughs> I don't know if you ever counted up all the, all the kids that ran away and stayed at your house, but it must thousands. have been the hundreds, thousands, if really. I, I, if, if we had about I, I think roughly maybe three, three, three hundred and fifty different kids a year. There mm -hmm. were plenty of repeaters too. Yeah, how uh, long would typically uh, a, kid, a runaway kid stay there? I mean, well, I had the magic uh, 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 answer to that. We didn't feed them. Oh. <laughs> you, you let them sleep <laughs> there, but you didn't feed them. That's right. They, so they didn't you stay. Couldn't for get long. that comfortable. And then, of course, they would miss their friends. This is in the, this is before Facebook and all that. And, yeah. uh, you know, they missed their friends, and they but they probably liked the fact their parents didn't know where they were. Sometimes the parents did find out they, they, where they were. They would come and they barge in the front door and demand that their daughter or whatever, who, who was I? You know, of course, I was always under suspicion as a preying on these kids and the cops <coughs> didn't like us very much and they would tell the parents that that's what we were doing. Why um, didn't the cops like you when you were making these kids safe basically? They were of the opinion that the kids just belong back at home and the only way to get them at home was to arrest them put put them in the uh, uh, we call it receiving home here in town yeah uh, and after uh, lock them up and have the parents come and get them um, I think we were actually much more successful than with the approach that we had because there, this combination of things, including hunger that I just mentioned, yeah. you, get, you move them along. And the other thing is you had new kids coming in all the time, so you just couldn't let that, well, whoever was there on Sunday, you didn't want to have the same kids there 10 days later because what about all the kids who were going to come in in the interim? So you had to keep it moving all the time. Mm -hmm. it, it had a a momentum 
uh, which is very demanding for the staff, of course. Um, we had police raids. The police raided it? Yeah, we've got Looking for drugs? Of, uh, hmm? Looking for drugs? Is that what they were oh, looking for? Oh, whatever they were looking for. I don't think they knew what they were looking for. Yeah. My favorite, my favorite one, uh, uh, and actually I'm in touch with one, one of the uh, girls who was there at the time, and, and she's a lawyer here in town now. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they would come. This one raid, they didn't, had a building inspector, and the guy came in. If you, that house has a huge fire escape on the front of it. Yeah. That saved us. That fire escape, it would have been shut down without that fire escape. So he found that we had a Coke machine in the hallway. And we needed a license for the Coke machine. It cost one dollar. <laughs> that that was the result of the raid. I had to go get one dollar, a, a permit or whatever for the Coke machine. Mm -hmm. So, um, and and uh, there was a, you know th it wasn't that there was no food because there was people would donate food and whatever. And there was a kitchen, but we certainly didn't have regular meals and okay. anything like you would get it up college cafeteria or anything like that yeah. in no way so uh, it was pretty crazy I've got some great pictures of uh, the, the, the runaway house and kids hanging all over and the fire escape and everything we'd like to get some of those into our archives oh, if you I want would to give us like some of those photos well. now after runaway house uh, ran its course and so that you had a continuing career dealing with youth, it, was it mostly through this publication, Youth Today, or what, what yeah, other things did you I, do? I, 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 my, my career and my career ladder uh, was uh, of, of wanting to go up to the next rung, but there wasn't any rung, so I had to build the rung, then I could climb up to it. Uh -huh. So I had, to, I had a national organization that I ran for many years, and then it eventually, I, uh, it was a different organization, but I got funding to start a newspaper called Youth Today, the newspaper on youth work. And that's that was a I, national newspaper? Yeah, it was a national newspaper. And, and who's that's its audience? I, huh? Who's the Pe audience? People who work with youth, yeah. juvenile court, uh, Girl Scouts, mm -hmm. drug and alcohol abuse counselors, whoever I could get to read it. Um, and there's an awful lot of people who do youth work and after some people call it after school and all these different titles but basically it's working with kids in groups it's really what it is is it still going no no, no. I, when my you successor retired, retired? ran it into the ground very very quickly i must say uh. a lot of these things and that we're talking about in this whole they were really labor of love for yeah. the people who who ran them and the leadership, it's one of my really good staff people at, the, at Saja, the running house, once, who now runs a big agency in California, said to me, it's, it's too bad leadership is everything, but it is. Uh -huh. And when you lost the leader, uh -huh. because, you know, with the drive, the momentum, and kept it going and figured out what to do with no money, then... Um, these things would just wither and die. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sometimes it looked easy to outsiders or even to your own staff, mm -hmm. but not so easy. And almost everything that I got involved in didn't survive because nobody could keep it going financially. Well, uh, that's a common story, but a lot of the th things that we story. did in the 60s ended up being pilots for later projects and later things, so Absolutely. there was a use usefulness to them that at the time we didn't all recognize. Right. You had to come up with some kind of a steady funding stream. Yeah. And for all but a handful of exceptions, that meant government money at one level or another. So you couldn't k keep something like the new education project at the high school. You couldn't keep that going unless you can now have what we have, charter schools, then yeah. fine, it would be easy to keep it going. Same with some of the employment and training things. There wasn't real money for that at the time. Um, so, what's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Somebody, maybe we're blocking? <laughs> just, <laughs> just, yeah. I should have turned it off. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. Well, I want to talk to you. Uh, you had this long career, and that's how most people in Washington knew you, the elected position mm -hmm. and the runaway house. But you were also a pretty busy political person all that time. Uh, you 
I want to talk a little bit more about the, the Poor People's Campaign in that year of 1968, um, which also included the riots at the, the police riots at the Chicago Convention, and so much changed in 1968. Right, right. But do you remember during the Poor People's Campaign um, when Bobby Kennedy died? Yes, that was right in the June, middle of it. Right. There was this. There was this. I, I was down there that night too, and there was somebody who played the piano. I think it was Nina Simone that night or the next night. Mm. That there was this sadness and quietness of these thousands of people, that sticky hot night, and I just remember that it was almost surreal. There was some sort of music, but people were very quiet. Do you I, remember I, that? I, 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 I don't recall that, but I do recall. Ross Conley lived two blocks from where I was living with David Clark, who later became chair of the city yes. council. And Dave, anyway, so Ross came where, where I was staying. He picked me up, and I had the newspaper with me, and it said, Kennedy wins California primary or whatever. And Ross said, to me, have you heard the news? I said, yeah, Kennedy won the primary. Yeah. Of course, he was dead. Yeah. Uh, and I do remember his funeral and I remember the 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 uh, um, the hearse and the convoy coming around the Lincoln Memorial and going over to Arlington Cemetery, yes. and I was there in front of the Lincoln Memorial and yes. whatever. The Poor People's Campaign staff started at a, 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 a then vacant bank at the corner of uh, 14th and U, where the Frank Reeves building is now. Mm -hmm. That's where our offices were in the early days mm -hmm. when King was still alive. Also, it was, of course, a lot more optimism. Yes. You know, Abernathy just didn't have the he just didn't have the juice. Didn't have the charisma. That's he didn't have thing a of... lot of things. Right. Yeah. yeah. There were some very very good people in SCLC. Yes. And he was a good person, yeah. but um, it it was I think another example with you 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 lose the leader. Um, that doesn't mean you're you're not going to survive and thrive, but you probably won't. Well, yes. I mean, and SCLC never never recovered. They never really recovered from. No, from that. no, it didn't recover after the Poor People's Campaign in particular, um, and it really it's, it really went very much downhill. I just went to the fiftieth reunion of uh, SCLC workers and. The summer of '65, I, I was working for a guy named Jose Williams at the okay. time. Yes. So uh, Jose's been dead for many years, but a lot of the old timers were there. Uh, J.T. Johnson and uh, any, you know, a bunch of. Uh, right. um, but the organization is not even a shadow of its former self. The times changed also. Yes. Uh, and you try, and they, and I think a lot of the SCLC, some of the organs try to stay with the same issues all the time, and they just were, it, it just didn't resonate uh, as well as they did once. One so. of the things that that happened in that time um, was that gradually the uh, spending on the Vietnam War, which started for us really in 1965 with troops coming in, the funding for the war on poverty and the things that SCLC fought for. Would diminish, greatly diminished by the cost of the war. Correct. You know, so a lot of groups and organizations had that same experience. There was just not money to be found to do right. some of the things you needed to do. Sque squeezed out by. And the by, war by, took by, over. By, by 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 the war spending and it, it didn't break our bank, but it was uh, yeah. it certainly broke the, the the back of a lot of the oh, yeah. anticipated. Uh, uh, spending on alleviating poverty in different ways. Oh, the war on poverty was really defunded, yeah. essentially. Well, right? once Nixon got in, then it was actively being defunded. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't just the budget, it was also ideological. So... Well, I want to talk about one more thing with you, um, which is um, your your political life, all the time that you were doing this. And excuse me, we didn't talk about the Three Sisters Bridge, didn't you want well, to touch? Well, we were going to just oh, talk okay. about that now. I, so I mean, the there was a there was a major um, community fight in Washington all through the late 50s of the 60s and the early 70s called the Anti-Freeway Fight, which is a, a big citizens organizational fight to keep four or five big highways from coming into the city and cutting it up. and. Do you want to talk a little about that and about their specific demonstrations at Three Sisters Bridge? Sure, was, yeah. sure. Um, 
the, there was an organization called the Emergency Committee on the Transportation Crisis, r run by the great Sammy Abbott once again. Yes. Uh, and they had a great slogan, white man's... White man's roads, roads through black, through man's, black homes. man's homes. Right. And they had this great map of D.C. and showed the freeways cutting yep. through U Street and Brookland and whatever. Well, the anyway, freeways would have taken down lots of neighborhoods. Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. It literally destroyed DuPont Circle and, yeah. and the whole south side of U Street. Yeah. And Brookland? The, right. and, and Brookland. There's more land up there when, yeah. when squeezing through the middle of the city was really going to be destructive. Mm. Anyway, now there was a lawsuit going on. Some very good lawyers were pursuing all this, and they had a, 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 a very important part in the ultimate success. I don't think it was all, you know, the demonstrations and well, whatever. Well, it was both. It, it was, was really both. both. It yeah. was exactly. It was a two-tracked uh -huh. thing. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, with the help of uh, quite a few other people, g uh, got... Uh, a lot of interest built up, particularly around the Three Sisters Bridge, which was going to cross from Arlington, right where there's three little rocks in the Potomac River. Those are the Three Sisters. Right. It was going to be an ugly thing across a beautiful part of the Potomac. R right. Well, it was going to be a lot uglier once it got to town, too. Yeah. Um, and it, it um, so they had got the permit. Oh. I should say that the, the, the city government, Walter Washington, Congress, Congressman Natcher from Kentucky, uh, the Washington Post, they were all gung-ho for all these freeways. Yes. And, if, and since then, I have been to other cities like Milwaukee that have been totally carved up and defaced by their freeway system. So we were v v extremely fortunate to be spared. Um, yes. but it, so. We started uh, picketing and uh, camping out at this at the D, on the DC side of the bridge, which is down between the canal and the river north of Key Bridge. There's this area there. There's still, uh, I'm, I'm told, some old construction rubble and stuff uh, there. Uh, so anyway, we. Uh, we would march mostly from the Georgetown campus. There were a lot of Georgetown yeah. students involved. Uh, and uh, the, the cops, we, 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 we became more and more, you know, we, we really got, we got hammered a lot. Cop, cops really were pretty rough in those days. Um, and w one time we, we went and we occupied the Three Sisters Islands. We had big banners that yes. you could read from the bridge. Stopped the Three Sisters, been spent the night out there. My first encounter with arthritis. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, and, and eventually there was enough publicity and virtually no political support from the establishment people mm -hmm. of, the, of the city, not just the Post and the mayor, but just... But they were big demonstrations. They were big demonstrations, no, but the support was coming from really from, the, from, from students and mm -hmm. young adults. That's, yes. that's where the support was coming from. And some of the homeowners around the routes and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there were a, a number of women who had s small kids and weren't working, and they were doing a lot of stuff. We had a, it was a very nice coalition. Yes, um, and, and it was and a And success. of course, Sammy was, uh, he was very important. In Sammy, terms talk of, a little about Sammy Abbott, who he was. Well, he was really a fascinating guy. By, by occupation, he was a graphic artist. Mm -hmm. Um, he is a Lebanese, uh, a wonderful public speaker. He occasionally would actually give a speech with his feet on the ground, but he most, more, pref much preferred to be standing on a table or whatever was available, including at public hearings and things. Mm -hmm. And he was just a very dynamic, uh, emphatic spirit mm -hmm. with a great voice to go away. Mm -hmm. Little guy, great voice. Right. Um, and he, he, he was really the great charismatic figure. Um, yes. And um, so... The younger he, leader that he worked with, you also knew. Who? Um, the young man... Um, uh, Reginald Booker? Reggie Booker. Yeah, talk about him a little bit. You remember, you I didn't know him as well, but he was also very... He was uh, black, very dynamic. Young man. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, probably about... 
<laughs> didn't see that young to me at the time. He's probably 30. Yeah, it, <laughs> at, at most, right? Uh, uh, yeah. And yeah. So, so it, you know, it was quite, quite successful. At one point, we organized a big march, and it was an anti-war demonstration here in the city, the national demonstration. Right. We leafleted it, we did a lot of things, and we got a lot of people to come, and we assembled in front of the Healy Building on the Georgetown campus. We probably had a thousand people, mm -hmm. at least. But we had already marched several times before. They'd been beating up everybody, arresting everybody, and whatever. So we, they closed off. There's a couple of ways to get under the canal that a lot of people don't know about, but yeah. those were all closed up. So we, had to, we were going to have to march down O Street, all the way down to Wisconsin, down Wisconsin to K, and then back over there. Well, pff, there was no chance we were going to make it. They were just going to arrest everybody. And uh, so we decided just to call it off. Mm -hmm. And I remember a lot of people were unhappy with that, and I wasn't, like, thrilled about it. Who likes to call off a march? Nobody wants to do that. Mm -hmm. But we did. Uh, but by then, w public sentiment was on, on our side. And in that November, a lot of these demonstrations were, like, September, October. Yeah. In November, there was a local election. November what year? 70? 70. I hope I have that right. 69? Yeah, somewhere 70. around there. Just uh, basically. And uh, we organized these, these wonderful, all, all these uh, uh, women who were active, who lived all along Carthage Boulevard and through Georgetown and DuPont uh, du Street. And we had these cardboard ballot boxes in front of every voting place. And you had, we had a referendum on the Three Sisters Bridge. And we got thousands and thousands of people to vote. Uh, and I think that we began to get the politicians' attention then, as it certainly would today. Uh, uh, so it was, it, was, it was a very successful uh, campaign with really different kinds of people involved. It was about 13 years long from beginning to end. The struggle was. Yeah, 59 yeah, to 72. The, the peak of all these demonstrations were maybe four or five months, mm -hmm. that, that episode, we'll call it. Um, so... I was quite successful, really. I mean, I'm not sure it would have been successful if the times hadn't been changing. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the utility of freeways was being called more and more into question mm -hmm. by all sorts of people, urban planners, etc. cetera. And, uh, you know, urban architecture, it was added to Nadera, and they had just one ugly building after another going up in the city. And it's been... By the mid, by the late seventies, architecture began to improve. Not that it ever got to be great again, but it improved mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, so I think the times were changing. The uh, the the uh, interest in catering to the sub suburban mm -hmm. commuters as much. Yeah. Oh, and a very important element of the whole thing was the metro. Gosh, I don't know how yes. can I leave that out? That was really really important. We weren't against people from the suburbs getting to downtown and back we we wanted the metro we wanted the mass transit and that is what the political crux was the highway lobby cars buses roads remember oroid oil. Shark? yeah uh, all, all those people and the, the developers they all wanted the freeway they did nobody in in, in power really wanted metro Metro happened because it just, at some point, absolutely had to happen. There was no way of growing the city if right. you couldn't cram more and more freeways in. And we, as you know, like half the city is off, off boundary anyway for one reason or another. So uh, the Metro just had to happen, and it, and, and it then finally started getting funding and b building the system, I think in the mid-70s is my recollection. Yeah, the first, the first station, the red line opened uh, in 76. I used to use it all, I had to walk from, from St. Margaret's all the way down to Farragut, get on the red line, the only line, yeah. and it would go, I think it went to Union Station. Right. Uh, so. Well, in, in a certain way, the, the, um, a lot of people who worked on the transportation issue that thing felt that the, the metro was actually the result of that campaign. Yes, yes, but I would argue, let's say the campaign had been a complete flop. 
Mm -hmm. And even some of those roads had been built. Still would have had to build that truck. Come on, where's Metropolitan Area? Three million people now. Yeah. yeah. Who, who, I mean, we were just in Johannesburg, South Africa. They got a great mass transit system. Really? How come they, everybody else have and we didn't? Well, so. Well, listen, I want to thank you. And at last, my, my closing question is to you, um, with all these activities you did in your youth, your 20s, all through your 30s and all that, how, how do you feel this work changed the rest of your life or affected the rest of your life? Do you feel? Well, I was extremely fortunate, I must say. I had a wonderful career. And so, uh, I mean, it was never a prestigious line of work promoting youth work. I mean, that's a yawn. But... Uh, it had tremendous variety, I changed all the time. I would be in the same job for many years, but didn't feel like the same job because it just would change so much. Uh -huh. um, and I had to do, I had to be pretty good at almost everything. If you think of it as a report card, uh -huh. I didn't have to get an A in everything, but I couldn't get a single F, because yeah. then you flunk. Right. If you can't bring in the money, if you can't manage it, if you can't manage your staff, if you can't set goals and accomplish them, and all, all of those things that I guess people spend a lot of money learning in business schools, um, you, you can't make it work. And so uh, I, I was just, uh, you know, very fortunate. I got a lot of help from a lot of people. I think uh, the, in the newspaper in particular, I think I had about 35 different foundations who... Uh, supported the newspaper at one time or another. Um, so f financially rewarding, no, but <laughs> rewarding, extremely so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, lucky me. Thank you, Bill. Mm -hmm.